100% entertainment, 100% electricity, 100% Pipe Bomb Radio with your host, Felix Omeo. Be the man, you gotta beat the man, Austin James. And that's the bottom line, cause Stone Cold said so. And Nate Milton. Can you dig it, dig it, dig sucker? It. Welcome, everybody, to this, I guess you would say it would be our Thanksgiving edition of Pipe Bomb Radio, as Thanksgiving will be in about two days. And coming off of a historic Survivor Series, and I would say a pretty historic Monday Night Raw. Would you agree, Austin? Oh, Austin, are you there? I know you're there. Hello? Yeah, I'm here. Did we lose, Austin? Oh, that's right. He's no longer with us anymore. Ah! He lost. (laughs) <laughs> no, I have a lot to say about this. I have a lot to say about this, but one thing's for sure. If it wasn't for that icon, Sting, if it wasn't for Sting, I, w- I mean, I would still... You know what, I'm going to talk about more on the show, but if there's a lot I have, you know, off that one off my, my chest here. There's, there's a lot that you might not have seen, but in my eye, the ones that always count saw what okay. Sting didn't, and what the referees didn't say. But nonetheless, going off of that topic, I mean, the Survivor Series show itself was pretty damn good. Pretty damn good, I will say that. We are kicking off the show, the last show of November, with a guest that comes from a show that is really unlike any other wrestling show I think that's really out there. You know, I I don't see too many wrestling shows like this, and I've seen a few. And we welcome Nate. How you doing, buddy? Doing great, fellas. How you doing? We are doing good. Preparing for the holidays. Got a lot to say, and you know what? He's back. We didn't think we thought we thought we'd lost him last week after the after the historic uh, match at the Survivor <laughs> Series. But he's got some info to tell us. He says he's he, he's seen something that maybe none none of us really saw, and he's going to fill us in a little bit more about that. So we do have Austin back this week. But um, as I was saying about our guest, he is a part of a wrestling show that is like un, unlike any other shows I've seen around. And for those of you guys who have not caught on to Lucha Underground, you're missing out. Mm-hmm. Anybody Most care definitely. to comment on Lucha Underground? I know Austin's yeah. seen it. How about you, Nate? How about have you seen it? I seen the uh, I see I saw the first two episodes. Uh, we don't get El Ray out here, so I have to catch up via the internet. But the uh, two shows that I've seen so far, you're right. It's it's a different presentation of pro wrestling, and and I really enjoy it. You know, for me, I thought it was going to be, I had no clue how it would be accepted by, you know, the people who are fans of professional wrestling and seemingly that, you know, it's not, it's something that you many have never had the opportunity to see before, but in a different light, it's more different than what, than you can imagine if you didn't watch it. But I can tell you that with the five weeks or so that has been on air, it's been fantastic and it continues to just to, to blow me away. Great. And then girls, the girls are pretty badass on there too. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, Sexy Star, Eva Lise, and and what was her name? Sexy Star, right? Yes, yeah, Sexy Star, Eva Lise. Um, uh, the other one, I'm trying to remember. It was uh, Mil Mortez. Oh, that one's Katrina. Yeah. Yes, Katrina. Katrina mm-hmm. is. Let's just say she's got the, the 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 lick of death. I guess you could say. Yeah, well, besides that, besides those um, girls, you have Shava Guerrero and um, and uh, Johnny Mundo, who's John Morrison, um, uh, Puma, Prince Puma, but you also have uh, Cortez Castro, Big Rick, and Cisco, who've been running a rough shot over Lucha Underground, which I mean, definitely a topic to talk about tonight. With uh, when Ricky Rice, who's that's his, let's see, he also goes by the name uh, um, Cortez Castro, Lucha Underground. It's a topic that needs to be spoken about because I want to know. By the way, I really it's Ricky Reyes. For those who don't speak Spanish, it's Ricky Reyes, not Ricky Rice. <laughs> I just thought I'd throw it's that out right. there. It's, well, right. at, it's actually I'm I'm wondering about his his connections with uh, the owner of which underground, the man who calls the shots, Dario Cueto. There's there's lots to be spoken about because I don't know what their agenda is, but we're gonna find out tonight, hopefully. Okay. And what did you guys, I mean, as far as the end of, uh, <laughs> and the, I guess you could say the end of, of the authority era, yet the beginning of a new era, yes, the return of other things that we'll talk about later, 
but I mean the the way the authority ended their 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 reign, I guess. What do you guys think about that? It's showtime, yeah. folks. <laughs> <laughs> we want me to say, I have a lot to say about this, but I, mean, I want to see it for later in the show. All i got to say is that the icon Sting has ruined something for me, and, and he probably didn't see what I saw, and I see everything. The referees didn't see what I saw either. Mm. Mm-hmm. Without any further ado, just... guys, I did <laughs> have to check. A, I was screening a couple of calls. I'm sorry, I kind of tuned away for a second. We do I have our guest of honor, the man that is known as Cortez Castro of Lucha Underground, the one and only Mr. Ricky Reyes. Sir, how are you? I'm doing good. How about yourself? Doing good. We thank you for joining us tonight. we got a lot to talk about and definitely want to talk about one of the most unique wrestling shows out there today that's going to be kicking some butt, just giving the other wrestling companies a run for their money, let me tell you. But I'll right. kick things off, and I, I want to get your your feel. Your how would you describe if nobody's ever actually watched Lucha Underground? How would you describe that show to to a person who's never seen it? Uh, I don't know. I mean, you know, it's still a wrestling show. Um, I think mm-hmm. it's just the look uh, itself is a bit a bit more unique. Um, you know, they they try not to. Uh, no one's trying to like force you to like or dislike anything in particular, push any particular, uh, you know, characters on in a certain direction or anything. I think the, I think a lot of the times, uh, you know, other wrestling companies, I guess, try to, try to persuade you to look at something a certain way where we just kind of put the characters out there and you like who you like and you, you dislike who you dislike. It's not like for, children so much as it's for like uh you know the the wrestling fan that grew up with the attitude era like myself and and okay. other wrestlers of, of my generation i guess it's a little more realistic like you know and it uh i think people can relate better to that i think that's why the fans are so passionate about it it's uh a lot more real and it's a lot more entertaining in that sense where you kind of get lost in in uh in in the characters and storylines and stuff so so where did you pick up the interest for professional wrestling as a whole? During your childhood, what, what was the key moment that made you want to pursue this as a career? Um, I, when I was six years old, I remember watching Hulk Hogan beat uh, the Iron Sheik for the WWF mm-hmm. title. Um, it was on NBC. Uh, and I just remember watching it with my dad and my brother. And um, just, you know, you, as a kid, you just get excited and, I just remember being super excited, like, watching that. Uh, and uh, a lot of times, like, me and my my parent, my dad, and uh, my brother, like, the one time we would all kind of get together to do something, it was usually just watching wrestling. So, I mean, I knew at that moment that that's, that's really what I wanted to do just because I kind of saw that as, like, um, you know, like like a dream come true type of thing, like, if I ever could do that. And I just pursued it after that. So, I that's kind of like the moment that I always remember and look back at is like, uh, I guess changing my life or whatever. At, at even at at that young stage, I remember that that was the moment that it always sticks in my mind. Hmm. Okay. Now, Ricky, you've had a a long and and interesting career path. You wrestled in Puerto Rico. You were a part of the Urban Wrestling Federation, which we got to talk about that. Uh, but for a lot of folks out there. Outside of Lucha Underground, they probably remember you the most from ROH when you were a part of the Havana Pitbulls. How'd you get started there? Um, well, we we had gotten hired uh, with ROH when TNA pulled Chris Daniels and AJ Styles uh, off ROH events, and uh, we had been speaking with uh, ROH when we were in CMLL in Mexico City. Uh, you know, a lot of people think, oh, like, you got your big break with ROH. But in reality, uh, we got our big break with New Japan originally in 2002. Uh, like, our debut tour and stuff like that with New Japan was, uh, you know, in, in October. We wrestled in the uh, the Tokyo Dome uh, against Jushin Liger and Tiger Mask in a tag match. And, uh, nice. you know, a lot of... Uh, 
a lot of wrestling fans just kind of look at us like as if we started, you know, really getting it popular in, in ROH. But in reality, uh, we were already like pretty huge international superstars before we even stepped foot in, in ROH. Like to us, ROH was just kind of, you know, it was like a cool thing or whatever, but it wasn't like the the big thing we were you know, really hot on because we were wrestling for New Japan and New Japan USA at the time. So, um, you know, like, it was a fun time in, in ROH, but, it, I mean, it is what it is, and a lot of fans do look at at me that way. Like, they remember from ROH just because it's popular in the U.S., but before that, we were touring with New Japan and wrestling in CMLL, Arena Mexico, and, you know... um you know, all the big names that are there now on top, like those are the guys we were on the undercard with. So. And getting the opportunity to work in Japan, everybody takes back, I mean, they, 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 take, it, they take it differently. They enjoy, or enjoy it for a different reason or another. Comparing the, your opportunities, obviously, to wrestle out here in the United States compared to Japan, what did you enjoy most working out there in Japan? I mean, I know you have your what you like out here, but what was it that you enjoyed most about working in Japan? Um, I just enjoyed that the fans really respected the the wrestlers and, and the event as a whole. Like, you know, in in the U.S., like, fans, uh, you know, they they say what they want to say about pro wrestling, yet, yet they all still yeah. show up. And then they all still watch it every week, so you know. And, and they they have a, they have that right, but like in Japan, that no one's telling you what what you're really doing or what you're really not doing. They just really appreciate the technique of you know everything, and they appreciate the effort. The culture there, you know, it's one thing to say, oh, like I toured Japan and I went there and I wrestled and then I left. Another thing, like for myself, like where I went there and I had to stay for like 31 days, my first tour you know, and I uh, had a couple weeks off and I, I was really fascinated by the culture as a whole. Um, you know, like, um, just how I, I'm big in like, kind of like people watching and, you know, observing things around me. So, you know, I just really noticed that they're very respectful in general, like in, you know, in, in everyday life. So it's like when they, when they know who you are, you know, and stuff, they're just like, they just appreciate what you do. It's just very, very similar to us, like with heroes here, you know what I mean? Like you just appreciate what they do, but, but to them, they just kind of look at, you know, Oh, you're a wrestler. Like, like they just put, put you on a very high level uh, immediately, you know, and, and it, they just very much appreciate everything. So that's really it's, what I enjoy the, the most. It's like just the effort mm-hmm. that you give, you know, you could be really good or you could be really bad, but if you try really hard, and they're happy that you tried, like for them. You know what I mean. So, well, that's true. I mean, considering too, with that, would you say that that would be very similar when working in Mexico as well, or or even Puerto Rico for that matter? Oh yeah, absolutely. Like like uh, Mexico City was, you know, uh, like the crowd there. They're just the difference between those two crowds is like Mexico City is very very vocal, and uh, you know if they hate you that they. they they hate you, hate you, and uh, if they love you, then then they're very vocal about it. To where in Japan they look at it as disrespectful to like yell at you or something, you know. And if you uh, you know if you create that type of of uh, reaction, then you're doing your job really well. But um, for the most part in Japan, they just kind of pay attention and are you know admiring what you're doing and taking notes of what you're doing. And then in in Mexico, it's like. You know they're just as passionate and respectful. It's just like they just hate the good, the bad guys, and love the good guys. You know, and they just let you know about it. So now, getting into high school, did you have any opportunities to do some amateur wrestling? Yeah, well, actually, I did. Um, when I mean, I, I knew I always wanted to be a pro wrestler, like uh, since I was a little kid, and uh, I used to play a lot of basketball with my friends and stuff because I was born and raised in Southern California. So the weather's always nice. So I'd always be at the parks playing basketball with friends and stuff. And when I got to my going into my second year in high school, um, I just, I was on the basketball team and stuff in some rec leagues and stuff like that. And I just remember waking up one day and uh, thinking, I'm going to go out for the wrestling team because I want to be a pro wrestler when I graduate. 
you know, from high school, like that was just my goal. Like it, as much as I liked playing basketball, I was always a wrestling fan and, you know, always had it in the back of my mind that that's what I was going to do. So I just remember thinking that, you know, putting all my physical effort into basketball, knowing I wasn't going to go to the NBA, uh, in my mind, I was wasting my time. I could be focusing on wrestling. So in my sophomore, beginning of sophomore year, I quit the basketball team and then went out for the wrestling team and uh, just started training with them in the off season and stuff like that and conditioning during the summer. And then, you know, I made the team and then uh, that was it. Like I just, I wasn't very good uh, come like, you know, like match time and stuff, but I just loved training uh, and getting in shape and, and learning the techniques. Like even though I wasn't as good as the other guys, because some of them like, when you do amateur wrestling when you're a little kid, like you you obtain so much knowledge in different leagues and different styles of, of collegiate wrestling, like freestyle wrestling and Greco Roman wrestling. So you know, you 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 learn a lot, but I just only had like about three years worth of amateur wrestling in high school. But I mean I really liked the training. Like that's what I fell in love with was the the sweating in the in the gym and, and uh, you know, getting on the mats and you know, it was just like you build like a a very close knit bond with with a lot of the guys. So uh, yeah, so I, I did like three years in in high school, which prepared me a great deal for pro wrestling. Mm. Well, who are some of the, your influences or people that you looked up to uh, in the world of pro wrestling when you were you know younger and just getting started? Well, obviously, like when I first started, like Hulk Hogan was you know was the big thing. Um, but as I got older. Uh, you know, I, I started really kind of like uh, watching a lot more NWA and uh, eventually like becoming WCW. So like I really enjoyed uh, the wrestling, wrestling of it, uh, like Barry Windham and, you know, Rick mm. Roods and, uh, you know, uh, Arn and Tully. Like those guys really uh, kind of shined in, in my eyes, even though, even though the WWF at the time – was still like very larger than life characters. I was almost like uh, at a point where I thought it was too much character, like for me, because like I guess kind of like my dad would tease me about it, you know. He'd be like, "Oh, you know, Hulk Hogan's arm, he couldn't move it five minutes ago, now he's okay," you know. And I'm like, "Yeah," and I, I kind of bothered me because I was like, "Yeah, he's right," even though I don't want him to be, you know. I, I mean, I knew what he was hinting at. Uh, he was just teasing me, but. In, my, in the back of my mind, I'm trying to make up an excuse on why, and then I would watch NWA, and I remember sitting there with him, and and he would say things like like about ravishing Rick Rude, and you know, or like uh, Ricky Steamboat and those guys. Like he goes, these guys, these guys are wrestling, you know, these guys are wrestlers, and I always like that was always stuck in my mind. Like, okay, so these guys are like like characters, you know, and then and then these guys are the wrestlers because like. I remember when Arn and Tully came to WWF and they took the belts off demolition. And I remember telling my friends, we were watching what was, what became raw, which was primetime wrestling. Uh, and I remember saying like, these guys are awesome. Like, like they're going to beat demolition. And all my friends are like, no way they can't beat demolition. Look at them. They're fat, you know? And I'm like, no, these, these guys are real wrestlers, you know? And I would argue it, you know? And, and same thing when Flair came and, you know, and, and, and Kurt Henning came in as Mr. Perfect. And, you know, because I watched, like, Texas wrestling and AWA and, and all that stuff, you know. Like, I was, just, like, a, like today still am, like, obsessed with it to where, like, I watched everything, you know. And then when they all popped into WWF, I was like, no, this guy, you know, you don't get it. Like, this guy is the real deal, you know. And uh, so, I mean, yeah. So, I mean, eventually my attention, uh, you know, as I grew older, like, I started – started really enjoying like the Steiner brothers, you know, and I noticed, wow, these guys are using like amateur wrestling holds and moves and throws and they're wearing wrestling singlets. Like, you know, like my friends, you know, and me, like we wear stuff like that, you know, and uh, the things that they would do, I was very technical. So I paid attention to everything that they did. So for me, it just kind of evolved into the wrestler. And then I, I really enjoyed like looking back and watching like Bob Backlund and, and, you know, and, and those type of wrestlers, uh, you know, of that era as well, because I thought, man, you know, it's been around even before I even knew about it, you know, like like the wrestling wrestling part of it. That's why I always knew that a good base for pro wrestling should be amateur wrestling. Not that it needs, that, that it's a necessity, but it definitely helps, you know, a great deal. 
Absolutely, and getting the chance to travel around and work in different countries and get the opportunity to work with many different wrestling legends. I mean, have you actually had the – when in getting to travel around, was there ever any advice – about the, the the sport of professional wrestling that they gave you that really kind of held, held near and dear to your heart that you still remember to this day and probably still using your life now. Uh, absolutely. I remember when I went to New Japan uh, a couple times, and then and then one of the the head trainers there, uh, Black Cat, his brother is uh, one of the bookers for CMLO, and he mm-hmm. Black Cat when we were in Japan asked if we would be interested in going to CML. And we were like, yeah, of course. So I remember we went, and uh, we got there, and uh, Satanico used to train uh, classic Lucha lucha Libre at the Arena Coliseo in Mexico mm-hmm. City. So we part of our agreement was that we needed to go learn classic Lucha. So we went, and I'm just not good at that stuff. And, uh, you know, those guys are the best you know, around in, in Mexico City that do that. So for me, it was, I was a little uncomfortable getting down there uh, trying to wrestle that style. Like, I couldn't do head scissors better than Volador Jr. or Ricky Marvin or any of those guys. Mm-hmm. So uh, it was very frustrating for me the first few weeks. And then I started training with uh, Negro Casas. And uh, I'll never forget, like, I was doing some stuff with Ricky Marvin and at, at the arena, and uh, it just wasn't coming off clean, you know, like it wasn't feeling good. And he was just telling me, he goes, well, you know, your your value is that you're different. And, and you have to, you know, you can take everything, uh, which is fine, but, you know, you don't need to match the head scissors and the topes and all this other stuff. Like, your style is your style. Like, you know, you just got to learn what what makes it good is when you mesh your style with the other guy's style that make you know, and, and, and that's what makes the magic. You know, he goes, but you got to get your own stuff over you know, that's why you're here. You're not here to try to do lucha. You're here because you have a unique style. That's why you're here. And then I always remember that. And I'll, I'll never forget that. And I thought, wow. And that completely get, changed my whole um, attitude, really, with, with Lucha Libre. Um, because I was kind of like, I was frustrated because I couldn't get it as good. And it just didn't feel natural to me. And I felt like I was forcing everything. And uh, when I when he had told me that, like I just changed everything, my whole outlook on being there. Because at first I was like, well, I don't like it here. I want to go home. You know, I want to go back to Japan. You know, that's where I fit. But and then I started falling in love with it because and then I started, you know, working that magic where it's like, all right, well, you do this and this, and then I do this and this, and then you know, we we make it good. You know, so, okay. he helped me a great deal. Now going back to being at the New Japan Pro Wrestling Dojo. Could you describe what you guys had to go through on a daily basis in order to, um, I guess, go to the actual shows or be um, put on the actual shows? Um, yeah, I mean, it was uh, not uh, fun uh, at all, to be honest. Because um, we weren't uh, in the Japanese dojo in Tokyo. We were in the L.A.-based dojo, Santa mm-hmm. Monica. And uh, the issues that we had there to deal with were were probably similar to the ones in, in Japan. It's just uh, instead of having pro wrestlers come in and, and beat the hell out of us, we had uh, Frank Trigg and uh, Rico Ciparelli and uh, Boss Rutten, like, you know, Lyoto Machida, Vali G. Ishmael, like all these world-class shoot fighters would come in and they would just, you know, beat us up. And, and you know, we'd have to learn the different techniques and stuff like that. And, um, you know, it was very frustrating because... They looked at us like guys that wanted to fight, but we didn't want to fight. Like, we just did the training because that's what they wanted us to do. So Monday through Friday, we just did drills, 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 conditioning all day long. Uh, You know, then we would spar with, you know, world-class Brazilian jiu-jitsu fighters and uh, MMA fighters, Ken Shamrock, Josh Barnett. Like, all these guys would just come in and just, just use us as punching bags, really. And then they would all leave, and then we'd, mop the floors and dump the trash and do the dishes and, you know, vacuum the gym and, uh, you know, fix the ropes and hang the bags and, you know, so it was a Monday through Friday type of thing. But, you know, the, you know, and then New Japan would come in, uh, like Chono or Liger or somebody and Inoki would be in all the time. And, you know, um, they'd have us do like, you know, first they'd have a spar, uh, fighting stuff. And then, uh, then they would have us do like a pro wrestling match real quick. And then, so we went through different 
three different uh, people that have to actually get booked for October, which is our first tour. So it went like Chono came down, and then Inoki came down a bunch of times, then Liger came down, and then uh, the final person that would that would book would be uh, Mr. Uai at the time, and he was he was like Inoki's right hand guy, but he came down had us do some pro wrestling matches, really liked like the way we mixed the shoot style and and wrestling and pro wrestling style together. So he was in the, uh, ultimately the guy who would give us the yay or nay. So. It was pretty tough. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you talk about different styles, Ricky, and a project that I was actually pretty excited about before it uh, debuted and something that you were a part of was Melly Mel's Urban Wrestling Federation. What what was that like, man? Uh, Well, that wasn't good at all. Um, I understand that they wanted to make it different, Um but you know you, you you can't you know you're not going to reinvent the wheel you know it's it's if they would have looked at it like it was a pro wrestling company with um rap stars and rap artists uh sprinkled throughout it like it it had somewhat of an interesting concept i guess with like the crews um and stuff like that and like you know like trying to make it about, you know, trying to get the belt because if you have the belt and you have all the money. Like, I understood all that, and I was, I was you know, with it for the initial start. But you, know, you try to you try to talk to the people in charge about, well, you know, you can't, you know what I mean? Like, you can't have this this happen and that happen in these, in these, in these shots and stuff like that. And they're like, well, no, it's not about, and, you know, they would tell me, it's not about the wrestling. It's, it's, about, it's about the rappers. And I said, no, it is about wrestling because it's not a stage out there. It's a wrestling ring. So you're trying to hook wrestling fans to watch it, you know. And, um, you know, it's, you're, you're going about it the wrong way. And then, you know, at the end of the day, it was like, well, you know, don't worry about it. We're, we're, we're taking care of it. And then it, it folded, you know, really quickly. And it was a big waste of money and waste of time, to be honest. But, you know, um, it, in theory, I guess, like, they had something a little different. But they just didn't they didn't have the right people in charge and doing the right creative types of things. So it was for me it was a big waste of time and I just like from the start I just kinda rolled my eyes at the whole thing and I was just like, you know, I'm just gonna do this and get out of here. You know. And uh I was I was told by higher ups like, you know, we know what we're doing and we're gonna be bigger than ROH and I kept laughing, <laughs> thinking thinking that you're not. Um and that's like the worst attitude to have, you know. Um you know, and then, and ultimately, you know, it is what it is. So, <laughs> well, the crazy thing understand. I thought about, uh, uh, real quick, the crazy thing about UWF to me was, I thought it was pretty similar to a uh, Wrestling Society X, where you had a a pretty interesting idea, but the people in charge of it were not wrestling people, and then you kind of take that to a product like Lucha Underground, where you got, you know. Uh, people from outside the wrestling world involved with it. But at the end of the day, you know, you've got people like Conan, people like Chavo Guerrero, people that know about the business actually doing the wrestling stuff. Yeah, well, the thing about – here's the thing. I don't know anything about Wrestling Society X. Like, I wasn't a part of that. I was a part of uh, UWF, and and that was that was lost from, from the get-go, from right out of the gate. They were confused and, and had no direction. But – with Lucha Underground, the thing is, is all the right people are in charge. Like, there's real, you know, wrestling people in charge. And then with the um, the dramatic scenes and stuff in the, in the in the backstage, like, you know, the Hollywood people take care of that, you know. But no one's no one's half-assing anything you know what i mean like like the wrestling people don't don't cross over and then the hollywood people don't cross over into the wrestling world like everyone's so focused on doing their own job that yeah. no one's got time to cross over and, and mess anything up because like you know all you got to like for me all i got to do is show up and be in shape and and on my game you know what i mean and, and that's all i need to worry about like i don't have to worry about anything else you know and then the wrestling people in charge, they're worried about the wrestling and then, you know, the directors and, and executive producers and stuff for the show, they worry about, you know, their stuff. So it's like everyone shows up to the same building and then we all spit off in a different directions. And at the end of the day, everyone does their job and does it well. 
and that's why it's working so well. There you go. And I actually just have uh, my last question, which is a two-parter, really. Uh, what can we expect to see from Cortez, Castro, Cisco, and Big Rick with the Lucha Underground? And also, uh, if for fans who want to keep up with everything that's going on, because I know you post a lot of what's going on with, with the Lucha Underground on your, your social media, so if they want to keep up with you, how can they do that? Okay, um, well, with the group and everything, like, uh, we we do everything in, like, seasons there. Uh, so, like, the end of the season is going to be, like, this huge finale, and it's going to be, like, insanity. Um, so it's cool. going to get really interesting. And uh, right now, like, the magic of it is, like, I don't ask too many questions, like, with, the, with uh, creative and stuff like that. I just kind of show up. They tell me, you know, what's going down, and then I go out there and execute for them the best that I can and uh I could I could slowly I could feel like every week something was getting bigger and bigger and bigger and then when it finally popped off it was like it it gets pretty ridiculous so um it's Absolutely. gonna be pretty exciting and uh it's funny because like we're what four shows in and people are going nuts for it and uh you know I sit back and kind of have a good idea of what what direction everything's going to be going in and we've seen a lot of the stuff already and I'm like they're they're going nuts for this stuff. We haven't even, you know, what I mean, like like this is just the start. Like it's literally the tip tip of the iceberg. Like if people thought, think that what they're seeing now is innovative and hot and exciting, like we're just everyone's barely getting into their groove at this point as far as character wise. Even for me, like I just kind of like with the role that I'm in, um, you know, at this point on the shows and and stuff, we're just really starting to get our feet wet and get comfortable with everybody, you know, and uh so I mean it's it's gonna be pretty exciting and then like to get back to tapings in January, everyone's super pumped and, and ready to go. And then as far as like following me on social media, like my Twitter's Ricky Reyes zero one. Um you know, I, I post uh I don't post a whole lot of stuff there. I just kinda repost the stuff from Lucha on the Ground and stuff, but I kinda upload things that I see and, and find and stuff like that and just shows and events that I'm on and stuff like that. So, You know, definitely doing some – whatever you guys are doing is definitely working. It's become very innovative, very popular. And we just, on behalf of myself and, and Austin and, and Nate, we can't thank you enough for coming by and just kind of filling us in on just who Ricky Reyes is as a person and not to mention just the adventures you guys have been having on, on Lucha Underground because it's been phenomenal. We – you know, not everybody has the ability to watch the actual El Rey channel, of course, but you know what? They still find a way to watch it, and that's the whole. That's all that matters. And you know what? We wish you guys the best of luck, and hopefully somewhere down the line, once uh, uh, Season 2 starts, we'd love to bring you back maybe in 2015 sometime, if you're up for it. Cool. Yeah, absolutely. And we hope you've had fun, and we wish you a very good night, sir. All right. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having me on. All right, no problem. problem. You take care. All right, see ya. Bye. There you have it, folks. He is Lucha Underground's Cortez Castro. You like the way I said guy. that, Austin? <laughs> yeah, real good guy, isn't he? I love him. He's great. But he's even uh, he's even better as I mean, as a professional wrestler. Such a such a, he's been he's been in, in in professional wrestling for. 17 years, I believe, and he's done so much. I mean, I mean, been across the world and uh, wrestled um, against and alongside uh, many of the greats and legends that uh, professional wrestling has to offer. And he's he's only he, he's have continued to get, to grow and continue to just um, uh, get more and more experience and just uh, he's awesome. Uh, you know, he's continue to get. He's actually awesome. stepped foot in a WWE ring. It was brief, but I yeah. mean, he was there. You know, mm-hmm. he, not many people realize that or even remember, but. You know, I think what they're doing with Lucha Underground, I think they are just keep doing great, you know, keep keep going where they're going because, you know, the the the, the scenes away from the ring, they're de- you can definitely tell that it's very Robert Rodriguez type. If you've ever followed or watched any of his films, and I think, Nate, you probably have, maybe. Yeah. I don't know. Have you? Yeah. You can yeah, you see you, you get that feel of, of his type of uh, touch to it, and it's it's... It's pretty good, pretty damn good. And that's the pull. I just, that's what makes it I, I caught up with uh, last week's episode. It was pretty damn cool. Uh, mm-hmm. Eva Lisa, you know, I was always a fan of hers going back to 
uh, tough enough. I don't think she really had the opportunity to really blossom as a superstar in WWE. She tried TNA. That didn't work. I think she's found her, her niche right here with, with Lucha Underground. Same thing could well, be said her. about Son of Havoc, too. If you think about it, that's Matt Cross, mm. who was also part yeah. of Tough Enough. Yeah, that's Evelyn's background, you know? She's that's her, her the Hispanic background. That's where she's from. That's where I think she feels more within that lucha type of feel. Well, she likes to mix the MMA she, in it too. Yeah, that's where she's gonna she's gonna um, flourish. And lucha underground is just gonna start. I mean, like Ricky was saying, we're just within like the the fifth week of the show. Yeah. And, and people are already getting excited. Yeah. And one of the things I really like about the show is that it's different. It's unique, and it, to me, it has probably the most buzz of any show right now, even including the WWE. And the thing that I might like the most about it, besides it just being an alternative and something different, is that it's a show that treats minority wrestlers with respect without being like, this This doesn't have to be a Mexican show, but it treats, you know, the Hispanic workers yeah. with respect, whereas some companies, you know, you're, you're only going to get a Mexican wrestler when he comes out riding a lawnmower. And it's like, no, there's, there's more to different cultures than that. <laughs> or not, not coming out to the, we are the nation of domination yeah. kind of crap. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Or, no, 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 let me, let me correct myself, too. You know, a new day's coming. Hey, a new day's coming. I can't do the James <laughs> Brown. I don't got the voice for it, but that <laughs> was phone, ridiculous. We, oh, my God. Like, my phone was weirding out on me for a second. I was going to say that the Lucha Underground is just getting started in, in, in the season. I believe he said it's going to be starting. In, uh, it's going to be by seasons. That just that's new to me. I didn't know it was going to be like a, a season show, but I think it's interesting. Kind of get people a break, and then they bring them back to the finale, something like The Walking Dead does, which is the last episode next weekend. And people who watch her, I mean, they always, AMC, the creators of The Walking Dead, and leave people on that cliffhanger. And I believe Lucha, Lucha Underground is going to do the exact same thing. Uh, come there I'm sure the, they will. The season Absolutely. Here. Absolutely. You know, I'm not a Walking Dead fan, but I know about cliffhangers when I see them. So, uh, shut up, Austin. I don't watch The Walking Dead. I know you're going to let me hear it later. So, mm-hmm. with that said, with that said, I, I did touch on this new group debuting. You know, and it's very true with what Nate was saying too. With and, and it's not to bash WWE, but it is kind of really sad when they really kind of go with the stereotypes of, of Mexicans and lawnmowers or Mexicans wearing masks or, you know, black people, you know, they're coming out and, and they're in big militant type groups or they're in there preaching their gospel and, and, you know, hallelujah and a new day's coming. And, you know, it's, they, they stick to the, the stereotypes and it's not always a good thing. No, and, and it's not just the WWE. I mean, wrestling in general, oh, if right. you look at the history of wrestling, like it's filled with stereotypes. But the WWE, in my opinion, they have the largest eyes. And so, you know, I'm going to wait a week and see how, how the debut goes. You know, maybe they'll surprise us. I'd love it if this whole thing was <laughs> just a, a swerve for something different. But, you know, like it's it's 2014. Why does every yeah. black guy have to sing and dance on a wrestling show? <laughs> <laughs> no, you know what? You guys are missing. You guys miss a lot. I mean, that's obvious. But, I mean, the new oh, day he's going to be debuting next Monday on Raw. you got Kobe Kingston, Biggie Langston, and Xavier Woods. I, I mean, I, it looks like Biggie Langston is kind of a, the, the leader here. But, I mean, And it's not Biggie I Langston. Think, it's Biggie. It's Biggie. Oh, who cares? You know, same thing. But what I was going <laughs> to say here, that there, you're, not, you're not looking at this possibility. Biggie might be the leader for, for a second here, but I believe there's a bigger picture that bigger picture. I don't think he's Bo a leader. Dallas. Bo Dallas. I'm not kidding you. you oh, are you the, kidding me? Day, oh, you know, I thought we got rid of him when he got here. injured. Hear me out. You, go ahead, go ahead. You're hearing all these, these, they're preaching about, oh, we, you know, we love blah, blah, blah. We, we respect and, you know. Get you it. Wanna, um, Make your point, please. Make your you point. You know, I'm trying to, uh, shush. <laughs> I'm talking. <laughs> and Bo Dallas is always like, you know, all you got to do is believe. I mean, this, this group here would be perfect because they're preachers. And they're, they're preaching about the good word, you know, and the um, uh, just mm. inspiration all around. You know, I actually would expect them to come out as more of a heel group. They get people get annoyed with the crap that they start preaching and start booing them. They can only take so much good. And if you, you look at Big Show, he tried to come out last night and try to preach how how he's, he he did what he thought was right, you know, because it looked like Team Cena was going to lose and blah blah blah. <laughs> and nobody bought Feel that. It. Come on. 
Yeah. Yeah. Oh, here we go. Austin Biden. Austin Biden. Here we go. Felix was, you know, Big Show is smart. He did the right thing. And you know what? If you know what happened to Trevor Series, Sting, I don't know, I can put some profanities here, but I'm not. As, as much as I respect Sting, as much as I respect Sting, he came in with a wrong... What business did he have at Survivor Series in that match? I mean, he had no business there. And Dolph Ziggler's leg was under the ropes and the referee counted the three. I seen it. The referee's blind. Um, I don't know the name of the referee that the was... The referee's called was, um, final? No, hey, the fall might be final, but my eyes aren't. I seen what <laughs> the deal was. And Dolph Ziggler did not win. That is still to be continued. And the stinger... Is not supposed to. He, he makes no sense. Why was he there? there was Explain no to me was, what business Triple H had getting involved in the match when he wasn't even a participant in the match. He was just sitting there ringside. What business well, did he have what? to get involved and take the referees out? Simple. Hmm. He's a COO. He has to. He doesn't have and to. And that makes it right. And you don't have to. And that, that, makes, it right? and yes, that makes, it right? makes it right. And that makes it right. No, it doesn't because in a fair con- contest, he should not stick his nose in. He should confide in his competitors as he had confidence in them, or so I thought, until Mark Henry got knocked out in the first punch. That was unbelievable. I did not see that coming. But for Dolph to go as far as he did, that dude was made last that last Sunday night. His star w- it was shining bright that night, and you know what? I see big things coming on the, f- on the horizon for this guy. I hope so. I hope that, you know, Dolph, we thought we thought he was made when he won the world title. Then he got the uh, concussion issues, and, you know, they kind of backed out the gas pedal. But I hope this is the, kind of the restart of Dolph because he's really talented, and, and he, he, the fans love him. And I think, you know, the WWE needs all the charismatic baby faces they can use right now. Yeah, and, and Austin cannot deny Dolph is that talented. He is a talented man. You can't tell me. No, I'll not. give him his credit. He is talented, but the way that things were done this past Sunday night at Robert Series was And you know what? Sting, uh, Sting's arrival Sting was just perfect. Himself. was perfect. No, you Sting did. You got to explain, explain yourself. Oh, Sting. I'm sorry. Please. Yes, Sting needs to explain himself. He has a lot of explaining to do. Like what Lucy business said. does he have to explain? The man's had a 30-year career, and for the very first time in that career, steps foot in a WWE ring. Yep. Okay. Hulk Hogan's had and a long shocks the world. Already. If he comes in and drops the boot on somebody, do you think it's fair? Just because he has 30 years in the, in the professional wrestling business? The thing I don't think he has to explain himself to, to anybody, anybody considering who he is. Would you have said the and same thing had it been Hulk Hogan or, or The Undertaker who would come in and, and took in out Triple H? Would you have said the same thing? Because they are who they are. They can do what they want. It depends. <laughs> <laughs> Some would even predict to say that the arrival of Sting could possibly lead to a future match between the two. As Triple H, he, you know what, he can put on a suit and tie all he wants, but the man is still a wrestler at heart. You can't take well, that away from him. He knows what he's doing. The, the He'll probably go and step in, the, step in the ring with Sting at least once. Mm. And, and all, all that aside that Sting has done in, uh, in ruin this past Sunday night at Robert Street for the recording. <laughs> I still do think... So that is that why you're back moment. then, Austin? Is that why you're back? Yes, it is. I said that if everything... If the authority lost to the Barber Series this past Sunday... They lost? Then I would leave. What part did you miss? No, they didn't. No, because I, Dolph Ziggler's leg was under the ropes. And obviously you two didn't see that because you were looking at the other, the other way while it happened. So, you know, maybe you go back on the WWE... I guess your, your monitor went out when you saw that uh, Triple H got in the ring then, huh? You playing, well, you playing a Bobby is, Heenan on me? You better stop that. That's hmm. his ring. That's his ring. It's the police <laughs> no, it's actually Vince did. McMahon's ring. Thank you very much. Vince is still around. He's still the boss. Well, he was in charge before that happened. Triple H was in charge he was. of the, the show. And, and you know, it's it's just, you know, he's still in charge. You know, all I'm saying was. Were you mad after, at Vince after because after he basically put this ultimatum on him? No, you're not not, not entirely. But, I mean, <laughs> the guy, you know who I'm a fan of now? I'm a fan of John Cena. I've always been a fan of him, but I'm even more now. I, I think he's such a great oh, guy. Oh, oh. I, mean, I got I got to pose a question to the two of you guys, and it's something that I've noticed. I, I noticed at the end of Survivor Series, after Sting left, of course, and Cena came out, and also on Monday Night Raw, did it seem 
and maybe it was just me seeing it. I'm going to ask you, Nate, first, because, you know, Austin never sees nothing. His screen goes out, and it blacks in and out from time to time. So <laughs> did it seem to you that Cena was almost like trying to be a TV hog when he was with, when, when he was with Dolph Ziggler? Because Ziggler was on his way back, Cena comes out, and all smiles, and then when they did the interview with him on Raw, yep. Cena had to throw in his two cents when he was ta- when she was talking to Dolph. And it just it gave me the impression that could we see an angry Cena to come in the future? I'm not trying to predict he's going to turn turn heel or anything like that, but I just got the impression that Cena was almost like he's trying to be a a camera hog. Yeah, I I, I, I uh, don't think we're going to see a Cena heel turn anytime soon. But no, I'd love yeah. to see him. A more angry, serious Cena, and it reminds me kind of of when uh, Hogan back in the day, when you'd have Hogan teamed up with Jimmy Snuckle or Coco Beware, where you know the other guy would get his shot, but Hogan would always get the last word, and yes. Cena was just yes. take, taking up all the spotlight from Ziggler. So it's like I could easily see a situation where you know you get Dolph saying, "Hey, you know what's going on, man? I was the one." that won the match, you know, what, what do you got going on? And, you know, we might get a match between those two somewhere down the road. Because he referred Cause to himself know, as a man who, wrote, who who ran ran the place and the guy who steals yeah. the show. Yeah, and so, if you remember, uh, you that I, don't know, I got ago, that feeling. Wasn't that long ago that they had a pretty uh, intense feud, so I could easily see that starting back up. Well, well I just think... take, out, take, out, take out AJ, AJ Lee, of course. <laughs> you know, John Crazy Cena chicks, being the smart him. guy that he is, I mean, one of the smartest guys in history in the in the WWE. If he's smart, he's going to reinstate the authority back in power, and I promise you, both of you, it's going to happen. What makes you think that the authority is not actually the anonymous GM next week, damn it? It's Hornswoggle. It's always been revealed. But, I mean, no, other don't, than that... No, don't uh, say that. Blah. Other Sorry, than that, ahead. John Cena is smart. He has the power to reinstate the authority, and you guys are going to realize sooner than later that without the authority... WWE is going to be in, in, in shambles. I mean, it's, it's obvious. You know, I, mean, I will say this. I thing. will say this. Stephanie may not come back anytime soon, as we, we've talked about in speculation about her. And if you noticed, and I know you had to have seen this too, Austin, when she got knocked off the apron, you notice how much she was holding her stomach? I, I caught every that. time she was getting up, and, 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 and she was holding her stomach quite a bit that night after yeah. she got knocked off and was got a little, got a little dazed. I, I'm standing behind my, my what I've what I've read, what I've heard. It it just it makes sense. If they're trying to have another kid, and she's a little long, you know, a little bit along in her pregnancy, it's best for her to just stay off TV for a bit. I don't think so. They wouldn't let her take that. Triple H will off. come back. Stephanie may be gone for a while. No, no, no. I honestly because she got hit pretty hard by by Julie Mercury. I don't think it was. I don't think it, it, they would have let her done that if uh, if ever if she was pregnant. No, but, but she know, fell on she fell on Triple H. She didn't fall on the ground. I know, but Triple H is not going to let her hurt herself. Hit pretty hard. Uh, I think she would have been okay falling on Triple H. To be honest, I mean, yeah. it's not as hard as the the ground would probably be, and it's a little, I think it'd be a little safer. And, and, and maybe I'm wrong. Maybe she's not pregnant, but I still have that feeling. I still, with everything the way it's been going. I still think that's the case, and we'll have to wait and see nine months from now, I guess, or however long it is, however however far along she is. But yeah, I think all, she'll, all, uh, not, a, not a bad show, not a bad show at all. Yeah, I think uh, she might be back around WrestleMania because I think we're going to get Triple H and Sting, and the way that happens is Sting asks Cena to reinstate Triple H because he wants to fight him, and that's how we'll get yeah. that. Yeah, I can see that. And, you know, most – and what I want to say right now, and it really ticks me off because people are so deathly afraid of this now. Look, Undertaker has been around 20-plus years in the WWE. The man hasn't yet turned 50 years old yet. After the after he lost the streak, after the streak ended last year, this past WrestleMania, everyone look at it, people automatically assume he's done. What does he have to come back, come back for? The streak's over. He's beat up. He's, he he can't come back. Sting is fifty six years old. <laughs> Undertaker will be fifty by then. If those two were able to go into a match, I don't doubt without with, with every fab fiber in my being that those two can still put on one hell of a match. Yeah. I don't care what anybody says. If it's Triple H and Sting, so be it. 
but do not account for the fact that Undertaker is not that old. Oh, he's old. He's washed up. Bullshit. Sorry. I have to call a spade a spade. The man well, can still go out there and outperform most of the younger talent for years now. Well, he has one bad match, I mean, and all of a sudden he's cast to the side as an old man, as an old has-been? Come he, on. Sorry. Wait I don't a minute. Are you, are, you, are you talking about that match against Brock Lesnar when he, he lost the streak? Here we go. He oh, lost the match, sure. yes, he lost the streak, but he wasn't done. He never officially said he was done. Well, you got to see that the styles of Sting and, and the Undertaker are, are really different, but at the same time, they're kind True. of, you know, the same. But, I mean, the reason why I'm saying is because Sting, the way he played it, the way he, uh, he played it early in his career is why he's still wrestling now. His style wasn't Maybe so. that, you know, that that risky. And uh, that's yeah. since he played it right, and like you said, his one of his things he always says is longevity is a secret. And uh, he's definitely been around I for agree. a long time. And he can he can still go far better than some of the guys in this world that in you know, professional wrestling has to offer. He's still an Agreed. athlete. I'm not going to deny anything good. you're saying because it's true. He would have made it this long and still be in great shape if he did, if he didn't take care of himself and be able to match wits with guys half his age. As far as in the ring goes, he's can AJ Styles, Bobby Roode, Bully Ray, you know, and maybe even. And some are saying that he, since they, they they say he signed a performer contract, that he'll probably have one more match. I'm not one more match. More than one match. Excuse me. More than one match. How they were hinting at maybe he'll retire at WrestleMania. Well, they're thinking that he may actually have a few more matches before, after WrestleMania or even before. Well, you got to think yeah. that with WWE, they're smart about anything. That they'll test they'll test you out until. And you, they have the, the last into degree of your, your body and just uh, reviewed. Well, um, if you and remember they did too, thing, Austin, they to. I got I got to refresh your memory really quick before you make your point here. Is that if you remember, they are not really too keen on stars over fifty wrestling. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Don't you 40. think they would have to test them out really well in order for for them to be really sure, like you know, sure that they can still go and still be safe in the ring? I mean, they have to. They well, let, but let me ask you a question then. Would you would you want to see Hogan versus Cena? Yes, I would. You know, but Hulk Hogan really? being in condition, don't WWE probably wouldn't allow it unless they really. Well, I mean, unless he can pass the physical, I'm sure. But if if he That's were at the age he's at, could you see a 61 year old leg drop? <laughs> I'm just saying. I I don't know if he can physically still go anymore. Steve Austin, I believe it. Because he still yeah. trains and trains hard, and he doesn't have his his bodily injuries are not nowhere near as bad as Hogan's. Hogan did a lot of harm to his body, but if no. he comes back, you know what? It'll be interesting to see if that will attract, because his appearances do attract, but will his wrestling matches? I don't know. You know, speaking yeah. about guys who, oh, I'm sorry. No, no, I was going to say, the thing with Sting is that, you know, it's not like we have to look that far back to see him active. You know, he was just active in TNA as recently as a few months ago. You know, earlier this year, he was having solid matches in TNA with guys like you mentioned. So, with Sting, I think it's just a matter of knocking off some of that ring rust, which he can do off the TV. And then when we finally get that first, that first match, it's going to be like the atmosphere just for the match is going to be crazy. One thing I have to nitpick about is about Bray Wyatt. I'm disappointed because they build him up. They build him up to be this strong character and does incredible jobs with his with his promos and his whole character in general. And they put him in these, these little rivalries, these feuds with these big stars. And they have him lose every single damn match. <laughs> uh, what is the point? What is the point of that? I mean, when I seen and I and I was doing the I was posting the match results on our Twitter page, I called out on Twitter that with the way the match ended at Survivor Series, I wouldn't be surprised if we see a TLC match. And lo and behold, later in the night they announce it for TLC in, in what three weeks? Yeah. All I gotta say is this: when you got the whole world in your hands. It becomes a big weight. <laughs> and Bray Wyatt, that's why he, he's been losing. He's been on a losing streak. He didn't get out of it. He has those magical powers. And just like the Undertaker, you know, when uh, when he tells the guy that he's going to rest in peace, 
They usually do, and they end up six feet under. <laughs> um, Bray Wyatt, is gonna be the, he's the same. He's the same way. He's the same species, and he's gonna do the same thing. All those magical powers. That I don't even know where he gets them from. Probably from Blackjack Mulligan, whose birthday is today. <laughs> Happy birthday, Blackjack yeah. Mulligan. I wouldn't <laughs> doubt it, but I mean, it's in the genes, but uh, not the same genes Bray Wyatt wears. It's uh, he's he's quite the different. Uh, he's quite the character that's gonna transcend. But I mean, he's gonna get a, he's gonna get his way around soon. Oh, and I got to throw in a little comment. What y'all think about concessions, Kane? <laughs> <laughs> Come on, get oh. lays off, lays off. <laughs> get it lays as a food and it's a chip. Uh, you probably get a concession, Sam. Uh, that was too funny. I mean, and having Daniel Bryan come back for the night definitely gave everybody a new recharge and something different yeah. to see because he's been off TV for such a long time. And then what killed the night, at least for me, was that beep, 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 beep. Well, I can't do it like the damn, like you hear a pager, like a beeping, like the damn phone, like a, one of those iPhone beeps, and it continued and continued and continued to, and, and to close out the night. I wanted to pick yeah. up the damn computer myself and throw it. Like, oh, not this again. I think they're going to throw this back in until they decide who they want to be the authority figure on TV. And they're predicting Laurinaitis, maybe Vicky, maybe Teddy. I can tell yeah. you, Vicky and Teddy probably won't want to come back. But, you know, who could they be? Who could they choose in the authority figure? Maybe a Mick Foley, maybe Hogan. Some have even speculated Sting, which I seriously doubt that. Yeah, I don't think we'll get Sting in that position until after Mania. Like, that might be the step for the match with Triple H, but he's not going to show up every week until then. Like, that's not that's not the best yeah. use of him right now. Yeah, no, of course not. Of course not. But definitely an interesting Survivor Series and, and Monday Night Raw. But uh, I definitely got to throw in there, we had a great guest tonight, but as we go into the month of December, we kick off next week, the very first show of December, in a big way, absolutely. Former WWE referee current and also an author as well. We bring in Jimmy Corderas. Yes. You might remember him. He actually refereed the main event match between The Undertaker and Edge at WrestleMania 24. He's also, of course, been a referee with WWE for over 20 years, getting in and working. You'll be This name will ring a bell. He started work with the Tunnies, Jack and Frank Tunney. <laughs> and he was he had told some amazing stories. I bought his book. This guy was literally in the ring and got hit. I'm thinking maybe by the foot or a hand or something of Owen Hart when he dropped in the ring in 1999. He was right there when the whole thing happened. Right dead smack in the middle of it. And he went on to see many, many different things, and I think he even speculated a little bit of the feeling of what went down with Chris Benoit. And, you know, he was he's just seen a lot of things, been a part of a lot of different uh, moments in wrestling history. And after working with, working and, and begging and pleading, and I'm just kidding. No, I've been working with him for the last couple of months, since going back to WrestleMania, actually, about coming on, and long the long wait has finally paid off. Jimmy Corderas comes to Pipe Bomb Radio next Tuesday night. Nice. Well, you know what's happening tomorrow night? The Thanksgiving edition of Notch from Mama's radio show, they're not going to be here on Thursday, but um, they're moving their show back just today, tomorrow night, Wednesday, um, 8 p.m. Central, I believe. Um, well, it actually, uh, the way it's uh, they're planning it to do would be at... Um, yeah, it is 8 p.m. Central, 6 uh, 6 p.m. Pacific time, 9 p.m. Eastern, as they are going to, well, let's just say it won't be anything as bad as the gobbledygooker, but <laughs> they'll definitely have a lot of surprises in store, uh, more more things that are on the horizon for them, as they've uh, been invited to be part of different shows, and, and uh, well... Yeah, I guess you'll just have to tune in and find out what kind of shenanigans those two will be up to and the Raw Report with Dreamy Mimi. Well, you know, another thing, we're supposed to be having a Christmas a, a, a special kind of thing. We're kind of, um, next month with Not Tomorrow's radio show, we're kind of going to uh, all intercede on that one night. And my <laughs> Christmas wish, my Christmas wish to everybody, oh, I just want everybody to notice that me and Oscar have to form a rap duo. <laughs> it's gonna be the best of all time. And we're I haven't to told him about that, but I should definitely tell him. 
And we're going to sing, Oh, Holy Night. Oh, this Lord have mercy. But we're oh. going to make it the rap version, you know? Rap, <laughs> tap, map. Flap your oh, wings well, you and know, go back Oscar to the Oscar can do a rap off the, off the cuff, so don't be surprised if he takes you up on it. Yes, tough. That's what the police officers use. But, um, uh, you know, it's, I, I just like to, you know, me and him can be probably the next greatest thing, you know, and uh, I just, like um, like Little Jimmy and R-Truth, for example, but I mean, it's going to be fantastic. Oh, no, you didn't fantastic. just say Little Jimmy. No, you tell me he didn't yes, just I say did. Little Jimmy. <laughs> <laughs> Where the hell has he been? You, you heard he got I mean, Little Jimmy, figure. by the way. <laughs> he says, yeah, he's got his own action figure, I've seen it, and I didn't see it. Okay. But um, as far as this week goes, I mean, definitely want to ask you guys. You know, yeah, let's let's talk about this for a moment, since since it is the topic of the week. Considering we are a couple of days away from Thanksgiving, I'll give you guys each a moment to tell us all what you guys are thankful for in your life as of as, as of today. Nate, we'll start with you. Well, obviously, I'm uh, thankful for my family and my friends, and my health. Uh, in terms of this year, personally, you know, I've been thankful for uh, not only my podcast, The Kings of Sports, but also for uh, developing this relationship with uh, you guys, even Austin, uh, <laughs> doing this show, which, which has been pretty fun every week, uh, and I can't wait to see where where we head for the rest of this year and next year. Uh, and I'm also thankful that TNA has a new home on TV. And, uh, yeah, they'll be around for another year at least. At least. At least we hope. <laughs> All right, Austin. Lord have mercy. Tell us what you're thankful for. You know, I'm thankful for a lot of things. You know, for All one, right. my beautiful hair. My, um, <laughs> you know, I'm thankful for my um my facial features. Um, I'm thankful for the authority who's, who's going to be in power soon enough. Again, I mean Triple H and Seth McMahon. What, what the power couple? I mean on this, this um this month's issue of um I believe Muscle and Fitness magazine. I mean, you know it's just great things like that. Just gives my heart uh, a, a piece of you know a, a piece of wholeness that just transcends throughout him the Christmas the times and uh, the New Year. It's 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 great. It's really great. That's it? That's yeah, all? Yeah, that's it. That's all I'm wow. thankful for. Really? You know, you know, Nate, I really thought he was going to mention his tuna and, and tomato sandwiches. I was oh. waiting for it. Yes, you know. I was the, waiting for it, too. Tuna, I'm saying, yeah, I'm saying. Subway, the tuna and tomato sandwich is something that uh, it's it's more magical than Christmas itself. That's, just, that's all I'm going to say about that. More, it's more magical, magical than, than, than Christmas drinking itself. eggnog on Christmas Eve or Christmas Day? Eggnog doesn't in- compare us to anything about two and three sandwiches, but I mean, I guess in your world it does because you live in California. What does that mean? Oh yeah, I'm forgotten. I'm the one part of the orange people. Yes, you are. <laughs> yes, you are. You're not understanding you. You're agreeing with me, which is probably the best thing for both of you to do. <laughs> Anyways, well, I guess it would be left up to me to say, well. You know, I am thankful for the success of the show that has had over the last, uh, going on two years now, uh, since the revamp of the show when I originally started it back in 2011, and took it on what I thought was an interesting ride, and took a break for a while, and brought it back in 2013, and it's been an adventure ever since. And of course, I definitely am thankful for my family and and friends and and finding a friend that I hadn't talked to in in, in 25 years. And that was quite an interesting little birthday gift I found. He was a very close friend of mine, and we found we we touched bases again and caught up a little bit, and that was definitely a blessing. Uh, <laughs> well, I can definitely say the Pipe Bomb Radio family has continued to grow from. Just myself and Austin to Elio to ends Canella, and then bringing in Nate, the debut of Not Your Mama's Radio Show with Oscar, Mimi, and Mo. It's continued to grow, and the adventures 
continue to continue, and I can tell you the best is yet to come. I know I say that every week and every other week, but it's true. You just never know what kind of shenanigans Pipe Bomb Radio will have, or for that matter, not your mama's radio show. <laughs> and I'm thankful for all that. You know, some people will continue to say they don't, they wish they would have done something different, but you know what? When it comes to the show, I think we've continued to do everything right. If we haven't, then I, then I I don't see how we can make it any better because I really feel that we 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 were able to gain the respect of many people we've either watched on TV or just, you know, everybody in the wrestling world. I mean, we brought on everybody and people from the reality world as well. And I appreciate that. And I appreciate our listeners as well. Uh, other than that, I like Subway too, but I don't like tuna and tomatoes. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> but yeah, it's been it's it's an interesting concept, and you know, hey, things can only get better from here, and bring on bigger and better stars, and and who knows, bring on more shows. Who knows? Who knows? You never know. For all we know, maybe in 2015 we might even bring on old Groucho himself, CM Punk. <laughs> no, CM Punk. You know, is he's man. been he's been a real grouch to everybody and don't like to talk to nobody and don't like pictures with nobody. He just don't like anybody. Yeah. Kind of like kind of reminds me of somebody. That's that reason. I'd love to hear Austin and CM Punk for five minutes. That would be brilliant. No, no, <laughs> CM Punk is a CM Punk is a man with his own ideals. He's a person who leaves himself. And he has his own. He has his reasons for the way he he thinks, and that's him, you know. And uh, I respect that. And uh, he has his own way about to to go about things, and I think that's gonna work out for him. Okay, fair enough. With that, I do want to pose one last question to the both of you, and that being Austin, I'll start with you. If you have anything to plug, anything you want to mention that you'll be doing or taking part in, throw you out throw out your plugs now. Go for it. You you can follow me on Twitter at the underscore Austin James. I won't follow you back, but uh, on Instagram, <laughs> well, it, it depends who you are, you know. Um, uh, on Instagram, you can follow me at the underscore Austin James. On Facebook, you can find me, and if you don't have any friends, which is perfectly perfectly understandable, you can uh, you can find me at Austin Porsche, and uh, we will be friends. <laughs> long, you know I mean? um, other than that, you can check out my graphic design page, Austin James Graphic Design on Facebook. I mean, every single pixel that I put into the graphic designs I do are made with love and, and passion and just, uh, and, and you know, every other emotion that I didn't mention before. It's it's a beautiful thing. But besides that, that's all that I have for you. <laughs> And Nate, go ahead and uh, throw out any plugs you got, your podcast, and anything else that you're taking part in. All right. Uh, hold on. Hello? Uh, if I can have your attention, please. I've received a message from the general manager. Oh, my God. And, and I quote, you can catch an all-new episode of the Kings of Sport on iTunes and Stitcher. Uh, check us out on Facebook, facebook.com backslash the Kings of Sport. And, uh, Kyle Pot on Twitter, KOS underscore POD. We got a fun episode this week. It's our Thanksgiving episode, so we got a couple special guests, a lot of fun topics. And, you know, we also uh, talk about what's going on out in Ferguson. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of people out there that are that are hurting. So I just, you know, if you're a praying person, pray for the people out there that everybody's safe and, and smart out there. Okay. Interesting little way to do that. I, I, I thought that was pretty neat. Um <laughs> That it's might get you shot if you go to a that. wrestling show, though, let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> like I, oh, I, I felt the same way you did, Felix, at the end of Raw. I was like, are we going back to this again? But, you know, I heard, too, and, and somebody captured a clip of the end of Raw that when it went off the air. It looked like they brought Michael Cole in the ring and, and Dolph Ziggler took his head off. Yeah, they super kicked him. What yes, a disrespectful yes. guy. And to take a win like he did at Survivor Series this past Sunday with the help of Icon Sting makes me Are you angry. still whining you know about what? that? You know what? <laughs> I'll be I'll be okay because in time, time heals itself. 
and things will be put back together just like Humpty Dumpty was. So it's going to be great. It's going to get, it's okay. going to be perfect for me. You're going to see. <laughs> okay, if you say so. If you say so. In the meantime, tune in to Not Your Mama's radio show tomorrow night, their Thanksgiving special with Oscar and Sir Mo and Dreamy Mimi. And on behalf of us here at Pipe Bomb Radio, Felix Austin and Nate, we wish you all a very safe a very happy Thanksgiving with everybody, and we hope you get to spend it with your loved ones. Keep your feet on the ground and keep reaching for the stars, guys. Good night, everybody. Good night, Austin. Good night, Nate. Good night. Make it, make it, make it, make it.